Welcome to the Stockton and Darlington Railways Bite Size Mythbuster number one. This is a short discussion of just over 10 minutes between Caroline Hardy and Nal Hammond, both trustees of the Friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, and who are also owners of the new Stockton and Darlington Railway Company, which is an online gift shop selling UK-made designer gifts that celebrate our railway heritage. For discussion today... Was the meeting between Edward Pease, George Stevenson and Nicholas Wood in April 1821 a barefoot lie. The story goes, on Thursday the 19th of April 1821, an important, life-changing meeting took place. George Stevenson, renowned for laying out railways and for constructing locomotives, and Nicholas Wood, a colliery manager working in partnership with Stevenson, travelled from Killingworth Colliery to Edward Pease's house in Northgate, Darlington. Here they hoped to obtain an interview with him about the forthcoming railway. Wood had accompanied Stevenson because Stevenson was a down-to-earth, roughly spoken man, and it was felt that Wood could help the conversation along, not least by translating Stevenson's strong, outrageous Northumbrian accent. Wood and Stevenson had travelled by coach to Stockton, then walked along the proposed route of the railway to Darlington. Their shoes were muddy, so they sat on the Bulmer stone opposite the glacial boulder of granite used to stand on by the town crier, and removed their shoes. They then approached Pease's house barefoot. This is the scene as imagined by Ralph Leslie Swindon, who wasn't born until 1888. The painting is in Darlington's Crown Street Library. As their visit was unexpected, a servant turned them away. Some say at the request of Edward Pease, who was busy. But they were let in eventually, and a discussion took place in Pease's kitchen, which resulted in Stevenson being employed by the SMDR to alter the proposed railway route so that it was suitable for locomotives. According to Samuel Smiles, who wrote the biography of George Stevenson, the conversation was full of mutual admiration, including a discussion on craniology and how Pease's head was, according to Stevenson, the correct shape for a determined railway pioneer. The meeting was important because the Act of Parliament obtained that very day authorising the works to go ahead was for a horse-drawn railway although Pease wouldn't receive the letter telling him that the bill had been passed until the following day. The relationship with Stevenson, however, resulted in a change of track. Now it would be designed as a locomotive-powered railway. In doing so, it confirmed that the Stockton and Darlington Railway would be the start of the modern railways. But how much of this story is true? The story seems to have originated from a few different sources. Samuel Smiles, Stevenson's biographer, promoted some aspects of the story, including the unexpected nature of the visit. Francis Mewburn, the SNDR solicitor, in his memoirs referred to the bare feet. Alternative and sometimes conflicting versions of the story, all written long after the event, came from Edward Pease and his great-grandson Sir Alfred Pease, George Stevenson and Nicholas Wood. Even Wood and Stevenson didn't agree about the unfolding of events. So let's look at different aspects to this story, what might be true and what is fanciful later Victorian reinterpretation. Would George Stevenson and Nicholas Wood have really turned up at Pease's house without an appointment? Almost certainly no. Stevenson and Wood were already renowned in the world of engineering. They were not uneducated hicks with oil behind their ears. From October 1818, they'd been working on a series of experiments at Killingworth Colliery, north of Newcastle upon Tyne, improving the locomotive as a method of haulage. They explored resistance, compared the results to horsepower, the durability of rails, the consumption of fuel at different speeds, etc. Anyone who was involved in the design, surveying, building or financing of railways, tramways or wagonways at a relatively senior level would know about Stevenson and Wood. In fact, amongst many engineers to visit them and work on their experiments was Robert Stevenson. Robert Stevenson? George's son? No, this is Robert Stevenson with a V. He was going to be the grandfather of Robert Louis Stevenson, the novelist who was born later in 1850. Anyway, back in 1819, he visited Killingworth to discuss, amongst other things, the Stockton and Darlington Railway. He'd been commissioned by the SNDR and Pease to check out the proposed route set out by George Overton in late 1818. The SNDR wanted reassurance from another engineer that Overton's proposed route was the right one. They had their doubts. Robert Stevenson, with a V, would have reported back to Pease and the SNDR on the work of George Stevenson and Nicholas Wood, 
so Pease was well aware of both engineers from 1819. In fact, it was actually Pease who approached George Stevenson, not the other way around. He sent a special messenger, the surveyor John Dixon, to Killingworth in 1821 with instructions to update George on the S&DR and to invite him to Pease's house to discuss. That the interview took place by appointment was clearly stated by Nicholas Wood subsequently. So they had an appointment with Edward Pease because Edward Pease was already interested in the possible use of locomotives. Further, Stevenson and Wood were already employed by various companies. They certainly didn't need to look for more work. It is, however, fair to say that in the days before railway travel, time was maybe a little more flexible. An appointment would be made for a day, but there was a reasonably big window in possible arrival and departure times. So when Pease was expecting visitors that day, it could have been any time. Such wide windows for appointments would be perfectly normal. It is possible that the servant didn't realise that these two weary travellers were eagerly anticipated. So what about the barefoot bit? Well, their journey was on horseback from Killingworth to Newcastle. Five miles. Then stagecoach from Newcastle to Stockton. 32 miles. Then walking along the proposed route from Stockton to Darlington. 12 miles. They may well have changed their footwear into a clean pair of shoes at the Bulmerstone, but crossing North Road and knocking on the door in bare feet seems less likely. Francis Mewburn, the company's first solicitor, wrote his memoir in 1867, and he said that the pair walked barefoot from Stockton and then put on clean shoes at the Bulmerstone in order to visit Pease. Nicholas Wood, in a speech delivered in 1862, made no mention of bare feet either for the 12-mile walk from Stockton or the short walk across North Road. In 1848, shortly before he died, George Stevenson was wont to put pen to paper about the meeting, and not only did he not refer to bare feet at any point, he mentioned in passing that the journey from Stockton to Darlington was after dusk and in stormy weather with snow. Not the sort of journey to embark on with bare feet, then? Uh, no. But to add to the confusion, his recollection was that having arrived in Darlington after dark, they stayed the night at an inn opposite the church, then visited Pease in the morning. If so, there's even less reason to change shoes on the Bulmer Stone. This account conflicts with Wood's recollection, which is that the meeting took place at the end of the day after they walked from Stockton, and the discussion took so long that they missed the stagecoach back to Newcastle and walked the long 18 miles to the next stop at Durham, presumably with shoes on. On balance, it seems highly unlikely that the pair arrived at Pease's house barefoot, and it's frankly absurd to think that they walked through snow in the evening for 12 miles with no shoes on. The Bulmer Stone was to become inextricably associated with the development of the railway, and this plaque, produced as part of the railway centenary celebrations in 1925, featured both the stone and Stevenson's locomotion number one. The Bulmer Stone is still there though, and if you wanted to change into clean shoes or give your walking shoes a bit of a clean, then it's very conveniently positioned if you happen to be visiting Edward Pease's house or bang a kebab. Unfortunately, the stone is now imprisoned behind bars, so you can't sit on it to change your shoes. Free the Bulmer Stone. What about Wood accompanying Stevenson? Because Stevenson was hard to understand because of his strong accent. So Wood was there to translate? Stevenson would have had a strong Northumbrian accent. In the days before national tra train travel, people rarely ventured beyond their local area, so accents were much stronger than they are now. Train travel started the process of diluting them. Further, Stevenson had a very little education as a child. His parents couldn't afford it. I've heard he was illiterate. He remedied that from about the age of 18 by going to night school. By the time of this meeting, he was a tall, powerfully built 41-year-old who cut a commanding figure and he had a well-established reputation in his field and income from several sources. He was perfectly capable of making himself understood, although he does appear to have lacked pretensions. Edward Pease liked this about him. Indeed, that meeting proved to be the start of a lifelong friendship. This is a scene described in Edward Pease's diaries and later depicted by Alfred Rankley, with George Stevenson apparently giving Edward Pease's daughters lessons in embroidery in Pease's house in Darlington in 1823. So now you're telling me George Stevenson was an expert in embroidery? He certainly claimed to be. When he was a brakesman at Killingworth, he learnt the art of embroidery while working the pitman's buttonholes by the engine fire at night. 
Wood was a colliery manager, and he had a more privileged upbringing than Stevenson, although he only went to his village school at Crocrook, so it's not obvious that his accent would have been significantly easier to understand than George's. But it's more likely that Wood accompanied him because they were partners together in the experiments being conducted on locomotive power and the use of rails. It was their collective expertise that Pease was looking for, not just George's. And what about the discussion between Stevenson and Pease regarding craniology? This sounds like later Victorian fancy again. Craniology, or phrenology as it was also known as, was the scientific study of the shape and size of the skulls of different human races. It was fashionable in the 18th and 19th centuries and made some unfortunate links between skull size and shape with intellectual attributes. It led to some unfortunate theories which supported racist beliefs and has since been discredited as a pseudoscience. The myth suggests that Stevenson said to Pease as they departed, I think, sir, I have some knowledge of craniology, and from what I see of your head, I feel sure that if you will buckle to this railway, you are the man to carry it through. So the question is, did this discussion happen? Well, it wasn't mentioned by Nicholas Wood, George Stevenson or Edward Pease in any of their later accounts. It wasn't mentioned by Samuel Smiles either. It sounds like a local legend printed in various local books, such as the Darlington Half Holiday Guide of 1899. Anything else? Well, they may have met in the kitchen downstairs, as it seems likely and hospitable to offer the weary travellers refreshments. What, for a kebab or a pizza? Eh, uh, no, but we do need to myth-bust the location of Edward Pease's house, perhaps on another day. Regardless of footwear and skull size, it was an historic meeting. The collective expertise of two renowned railway engineers and inventors and a retired wool merchant created a railway that would be locomotive powered and run on iron rails. They drew up a plan that day for something that would set the Stockton and Darlington Railway apart from railways that had gone before. The following day, Pease found out that the SNDR bill had become an act of parliament and he wrote to Stevenson to tell him. He would have realised that in changing the plans for the railway that another act of parliament would be required and that was obtained in 1823. Thanks to that meeting, the SNDR would be the railway that got the world on track and Stevenson would be employed by the SNDR and then go on to spread his knowledge and expertise on building railways and locomotives throughout the country. Stevenson's contribution to the development of the modern railway network has been recognised in our range of designer gifts inspired by him, including, amongst other things, pewter bookmarks, carriage clocks, products decorated with locomotion number one, which was designed by him, and a signed book on Wylam, where Stevenson was born. Do have a browse at www.therailwaystation.shop.